Hello everyone and welcome to the Snapdragon Education Project. My name is Sarah and I'm a graduate student teaching assistant currently in biology. I created the Snapdragon Education Project here on YouTube to assist my students in learning the material and hopefully it'll further assist those that I am unacquainted with. Today's hot topic is hypothesis testing and the one and only scientific method. Remember, it is not science if it is not addressed or is unable to be addressed using the scientific method. Words to live by. Now, some of the topics that we are going to be tackling today are as follows. What is science? The one and only scientific method, data visualization, treatments, and replication. And I'm going to post a separate video giving you a very in-depth example of the scientific method and its role in doing an experiment regarding a concept of neuroscience. So that should be really interesting for anyone who is interested in neuroscience and the brain. So what is science? Well, the dictionary defines science as a systematically organized body of knowledge on a particular subject. It is important to note that this body of knowledge is continually growing with the addition of new research and what is truly amazing about science is it is a global human effort to understand how the natural world works. And how do we attempt to understand how the natural world works? The scientific method. Now remember, for something to be considered science, a question must be defined and addressed using the scientific method. Now there are approximately eight steps, give or take a few, depending on what you're reading, what manual you're looking at, etc. But step one is always going to be observation. Your observation can be personal or based on previous research. Now once you've made your observation, step two is creating your question. Now this question has to be well defined because if it is not well defined, it's gonna be hard creating an experimental design to address your question. So you gotta have an idea of what you wanna learn, what you wanna address so that you can efficiently determine how you're going to address it. Step three, well that's the hypothesis. Now remember there is the null hypothesis and then you can have one or more alternative hypotheses. The null hypothesis is just stating that there is no effect or no influence of a predictor of a predictor, excuse me, on a particular response. The alternative hypothesis is stating that there is an effect of the predictor or an influence of the predictor on the response. Now, whether it is stated as effect or influence has mostly to do with whether your study is causal or correlative, which is once again going to um, depend on your well-defined question. Now step four, once you have your hypothesis, you need to make a prediction. It is in essence an a priori answer to your hypothesis. Most people tend to get these mixed up because they do coincide with one another, but your prediction is not your hypothesis. So the prediction is your a priori answer to your own hypothesis, generally written in if then statements. So once you have come up with your hypothesis, your question, and your prediction, you can then move on to steps five and six, which is data collection and experimental design. If your question is not well-defined, you will not be able to accomplish the experimental design portion of your study. So there are certain things that you need to keep in mind when you're coming up with an experimental design, one of which is the independent variable, and that is what you're manipulating, what you change, in order to induce a response in the dependent variable. The dependent variable is often sometimes, well, often referred to as the response variable. This is what you are observing as an effect of the independent variable. And then of course there is also the standardized variables. These are the control variables that must remain the same because they have the potential to affect the dependent variable. And you want to know that what response you are seeing in your dependent variable is only an effect of the independent variable. So you need to control for certain variables. My personal favorite is examining and evaluating the data using graphical design and statistical analysis. This is just Definitely, uh, it's not for everybody, but for me, I really love doing experimental design and specifically the statistics portion of it because it gives me the ability to really delve into my results and get an overall picture of what is happening. And then of course, step eight, once you have done your statistical analysis, you must reject or support your null hypothesis. Remember, you never 
prove your alternative hypothesis or your null. You are either supporting or rejecting. Never use the term prove in any research article that you are writing. It's always support. That's just a quick side note. Now, oh, and quick, quick note, if you are interested in learning more about statistical analyses, please see my Snapdragon statistics videos. Now, what is also mega important is data visualization. And I don't know about you, but you guys, but I find graphs to be very aesthetically pleasing. So data visualization is a big deal. Your graph should dict or should show everything about your results without words. Right? That is what the purpose of a graph is, is to show your results without words in a very straightforward way. So there are different graphs that depict different types of data. The graph you choose is going to depend once again on your well-defined question and experimental design. So you have to know what you want to address and then from there determine what graph you're going to use to address it. There are many types of graphs, one of which is a bar graph that is used to represent means between groups or even time series data. There is also pie charts that represent categorical data. Line graphs generally represent time series data that shows a change in direction. The scatter plots, these are individual points in a regression and then you fit a best fit line showing a trend in essence. And then of course the most complex in my opinion are networks. And these can be huge. I mean, the amount of work that goes into getting the data for networks is insane. But a network is just showing relationships between entities as shown in this picture here. And of course, last but not least is treatments and replication. So when you are coming up with an experimental design, not only do you want to determine your variables, so your independent and dependent, but you want to determine your experimental and control groups. So the experimental treatment, that's the treatment that's subject to the independent variable. It is subject to manipulation. The control treatment, this is the treatment that's subject to all the control variables. It's not subject to the independent variable. The control group is generally just used for comparison. And then of course you can have different levels of treatment. For instance, if you're trying to explore the effects of different light intensity on a plant, or a plant's ability to grow, that would be levels of treatment. And then of course, in all biological systems, there is variation. And so you must be able to do this experimental design in such a way that it can be replicated and hopefully the results can be replicated. So when you are writing up a research article and you're writing your materials and methods section, you need to write it in a way that a person can go outside or in the lab and do exactly what you did and hopefully get the exact same thing. So there must be the ability for replication. And that, of course, is the scientific method. So um, please look at the next video that's going to be an in-depth example using the scientific method with regards to a concept in neuroscience that is truly fascinating and everybody can relate to. I, of course, will put that video up at the end of this video so that you can easily just tap on it and go to the next thing. Thank you for watching.